welcome. We, we come to you today from Gadigal land, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands and extend those respects to elders elsewhere. Uh, my name's Toby Walsh. I'm a professor of artificial intelligence here at UNSW Sydney, and we have a panel of fellow experts to talk to you about ChatGPT, and in particular, its use in education. So would you like to introduce yourselves? I'm Professor Kath Ellis. I'm from the School of the Arts and Media. Sam. I'm Sam Kirshner, an Associate Professor in the School of Information Systems and Technology Management. Lyria Bennett-Moses. I'm in the Faculty of Law and Justice and Director of the UNSW Allens Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation. Thank you. Well, unless you've been living under a stone, I imagine you might have heard about ChatGPT, which is an AI tool that was released uh, the last day of November um, and has really captured people's imagination. It's a conversational tool. It's an AI that you could have a conversation with. You can ask it questions. You can get it, if you want, to write an essay. Um, you can get it to do lots of other fun things. It can write you a shopping list. It can suggest 10 things to do for your child's 10th birthday party. Um, many, many things that we're still discovering. It can write, even can write computer code. It's been trained on a large chunk of the internet, and so it can tell you a lot of the things that it learned from reading all of that text. Um, and I think it has some exciting and some challenging prospects for AI, so we're here to discuss those today. What do you think are the um, exciting and positive uses, since we have heard in the media already quite a lot of the negative uses, but I think there's great potential here. Absolutely. I mean, we're in the business of generating professionals to go out there in the world of work. These tools are already in the world of work. They're already being used. So one of the key things we have to embrace is the fact that our graduates are going to have to learn how to use these tools and learn how to use them ethically, morally and legally. Right, Lyria? Exactly right. Um, so, and you know, thinking about something like legal practice, there's a lot of text generated mm. um, from very simple things like a letter that just attaches something through to you know legal argument in written submissions. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting to explore how these kinds of tools can help people do that better. And I guess ultimately, this is going to be an amazing productivity, no matter what field or what organisation our graduates are working in. So. Those are some of the exciting positive uses. And I, I, I'm going to mention one other because I don't think it gets enough attention, which is that um, it's going to be a fantastic personal tutor. I had a colleague who wanted to learn Python programming and they spent just a day. And she said the fantastic thing was it didn't matter how silly her question sounded or how repetitive her questions. She had this infinitely patient um, computer assistant who could help her understand um, from the very basic to the quite complex. And so she said it was a real accelerator to have that, that personal tutor who you didn't have to be embarrassed about asking questions. One thing I've noticed, Toby, is you can ask it a question and it actually is really good at explaining things clearly and simply, even really complex, often quite nuanced and even um, contested things. It's really good at explaining them in plain English and simple English. So that's, that's some of the positive, but what about some of the negative? Well, should we just put it straight <laughs> out there? One of the things that a lot of teachers around the world are discovering is that a lot of the things we ask students to do to demonstrate to us their learning, their knowledge and their skills and their ability to apply those knowledge and skills, they can now ask a tool to do for them. Most of the time, it'll do a good enough or better job of it. And most of the time, it'll get it right. That's the simple fact of it. And as teachers, we're going to find it increasingly difficult to tell the difference between when it's the tool that's getting it good enough and the student that's getting it good enough without getting lots of false positives and making false accusations of academic misconduct. Which is pretty serious, so if we're not confident. So how could we recognise that someone had used it when they weren't supposed to be using it? Well, that's the challenge of detection. And one of the things I think we have to ask ourselves is do we go down that route of putting a lot of emphasis on detection? Obviously, that's where we've put a lot of our energies in other areas of academic misconduct and student cheating, which is the area I've focused on a lot in my own research, what we call contract cheating. Now, the difference here 
is when a student outsources the work that they've been asked to do by us as teachers to another person. So there's always another person involved. You're talking about some paying for their essay to be done. Well, so yeah. Essay mill. <laughs> the essay mills. That's the commercial side. But obviously there's also a non-commercial side, and that could be a student getting a friend, a, a family member, a student or a former student to do it, and no money changes hands. And it could be done out of an exchange of favor, favors, or it could just be done out of love and care. But what we're also seeing is a blurring of the two. So what we're talking about here, of course, is somebody cognitively offloading to a tool. That's what we're talking about when people are getting artificial intelligence to do their homework for them. But one of the things we're noticing is that while a student might get somebody else to do their work for them, that person is getting an AI tool to do it. So it's this kind of weird <laughs> blurring of the two together. But that's basically the guts of the, of the problem we're facing, right? Well, I think it goes even beyond just the whole idea of assessment and cheating to the point where there's been this very slow and gradual progression of technology entering the education space. You know, first with the internet and things like Wikipedia, pretty much made the textbook market you know, completely obsolete. And people used to pay hundreds of dollars per book, per term, for each course. Then, you know, if you think about the example of learning Python, for the last 10 years, if I wanted to learn Python, I didn't need to go to UNSW mm -hmm. or another university to do a computer science degree. If I just wanted this core skill of learning Python, I could go on YouTube, I could use LinkedIn Learning. There's countless ways of getting really great education on that particular skill. So now, I guess even with you know COVID and moving to Zoom, our lecture attendance is now going from like 75% or 80% in week one down to about 10% by the end of the course, largely because there's not much additional value in a lecture, you know, beyond what you can get by just watching the recording. So really, this is kind of just like the straw that's, I think, going to break the camel's back <laughs> in terms of really assessing, <clears throat> assessing what we are actually doing, you know, as a university and where we want to go. So it's really just time to take reflection and time to start experimenting with different methods of education. Sam, I'm, I'm reminded of the debate that happened when I was a child a long time ago about calculators. Mm -hmm. and, and calculators won that debate in many respects. No, none of us do long division or long multiplication now. Well, I think, there's a, I, mean, I think that's a really interesting analogy. Um, so if you think about the progression of mathematics teaching and the way tools are used, when you first start doing maths in primary school, you don't get a calculator. And it's all sort of mental arithmetic, learning how to do long division. You know, kids still learn that even though they might not use it their, you know, the rest of their lives after that. But it's an important part of understanding the process. And I think we'll continue to see schools teaching kids how to write, um, even though that there'll be these AI tools that you know, they can eventually get assistance for with. Um, so, so just going back to the maths example, you've got sort of calculators coming in, you know, some point early high school, and then you're allowed to use that. I still remember the the shock and surprise I had um, when I started maths because I did that um, undergrad um, here at UNSW, and we learnt Maple, which it turned out could you know easily pass and and you know probably excel in um, the four unit maths exams. Everything you'd learnt so far could actually be done on a computer, um, you know, automatically. Um, but nevertheless, there was more to learn. So you were then allowed to use those tools to solve some of the complex calculations that were everything in high school, um, but then to go on to something more advanced. And if you think about that kind of an analogy, I think that's probably where we're going to end up, that there'll be skills that you need to know. You know, children will need to learn how to read and write and so forth. But as they get more advanced, it's not necessarily, you know, it, it might be completely fine to use legally, appropriately, ethically, etc. Um, some of these tools in the course of, you know, researching and writing an essay. And I think one of the things we're really hearing a lot of, there's a lot of media interest in at the moment, right? And we're hearing from people like Nick Cave, like last week, he was um, talking about somebody had written a song in the style of Nick Cave. I, he was rather negative about, <laughs> he was, about this. He was <laughs> not best pleased. <laughs> Sammy J has had a song written and I've had it, like, I've heard him perform it. Um, pretty much every piece of media I've done, the journalist has had a go at using it to write the intro or something like that. But in every, op you know, every time somebody's done that, they've looked at it and said, yeah, what it did was, was pretty good or yeah, it was really good or no, it wasn't good enough. 
But the thing is, every one of those individuals already had the evaluative judgment skills to know the difference between not yet good enough and good enough and good. And that's the point I think you're making. There are certain things we need students to know to, how they can to do. They need the knowledge and the ability without the assistance of these tools, because that's only by learning how to do it from the ground up from scratch, from a blank Word document or a blank Excel spreadsheet or a blank piece of paper and a pen, that they're going to develop the skills they need to know the difference between not yet good enough and good enough. And so knowing when that has to happen and when it doesn't have to happen, that's one of the decisions I think when you're talking about it, we need to stop and rethink, don't we? Yes, and I guess we also have the ideal of, yes, students should be able to do all this, but we also then have the practical challenge of there is this tool just sitting there. <laughs> and you know, often, you know, if I think about just writing a cover letter for a job application, like that first paragraph is pretty generic, whether you have AI or not. You know, I would just as a kid or not a kid, but you know, in my early 20s would just combine all of my friends, <laughs> you know, cover letters and put together the perfect paragraph based on a blend of those, which is basically what the AI is doing and just you know, a fraction of the time. So I guess for us as educators, and I guess more broadly for the university, it's really kind of how do we actually kind of incentivize or structure our programs so that they really do achieve this ideal that you guys were talking about. Yeah, and I think to do that, I mean, I put back to you, by doing that, were you cheating? Well, no. I mean, <laughs> yes. if everybody else is cheating, <laughs> Is it cheating? Well, but I mean, I think it's, it's, it's contextual too, right? Exactly. So, so exactly. if, for example, you'd actually copied your friends' achievements and said that they were yours, <laughs> then, then I think that would we could clearly say Ethically, that's crossing a yes. different kind of line. Yes. But you know, academics do this kind of thing exactly. all of the time as well. It's not just a question of students. Yeah. Um, you know, people look at other. I mean, we learn sort of intrinsically by reading a lot, whether that's research articles exactly. in our area of expertise or whether that's, um, whether that's promotion applications, <laughs> which also have a distinct style. Um, but, you know, and, and it's not necessarily that you'll copy the specific sentences, but you do blend stylistically the different ways of doing things when you're doing it yourself. For sure, and I think that's the, the key point is, and, and Phil, Philip Dawson talks about this a lot in his book, which is that cheating is contextual. Right, the same exact same behaviour in one context can be perfectly acceptable, even commendable, that in another context, everybody would think, yep, yeah, that's cheating. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, somebody who decides to start commuting to work on a bike might use an e-bike to do it. And we might say, yep, yeah, fair enough, or even great, that's another car off the road. If that's what it takes to get you cycling to and from work, fantastic. But if a competitor in the Tour de France, <laughs> everyone is going to go, uh-uh, no, that's <laughs> cheating. And that's the point. I guess one of the analogies I'm using at the moment, let me know what you guys think of it. We're asking students to climb Mount Everest here. Like, university's hard. Doing a degree in any of our disciplines is going to be difficult. But do we need to know that the students can get to base camp under their own steam every single time? You know, maybe we only need them to show us they can get to base camp by trekking once. And then after that, they can get the helicopter to base camp, you know? So one of the things, I guess this is what you're thinking or you were talking about before, is what, it, what are we asking students to do, which is really just trekking to base camp. And once they've shown us they can do it once, we don't need to ask them to do it again. But maybe that means we should stop and reset and put our energies onto, well, what do they need to be able to climb Everest? And what do we need to make sure that they got to the top? I always wondered when I was back as an undergraduate why we had so many closed book exams. Exactly. I was thinking, well, out in the real world, I would be able to go and check the formula I'm trying to use here. Exactly. Um, obviously, I need to understand yep. what the formula is, where it came from, and how to use it. And, but having to memorise everything seemed to me, well, in the real world, I can always go and check it. And writing essays would be another example. A lot of people saying, oh, it's the death of the essay. I don't think it is. But do we really need to use essays as much as we do? Particularly in the professions, I mean, the one that comes to mind for me is, is nursing or optometry. How many times in the professional world of work are those people going to have to write an essay? <laughs> so. That's another thing to think about. I don't think we should get rid of them altogether, but do we really need to use them as much as we're currently using them? 
Well, of course, the tours are going to get better and more sophisticated. So some of the limitations we've talked about, but they're still always, I think, going to, from a technical perspective, they don't, they don't really understand what they're talking about. You're, as Sam said, they're, they're saying what's probable. I mean, if there's lots of examples of that thing in the web, then they learn how to say, you know, the business letter or the academic reference. Um, how are we going to deal with the challenges that sometimes they're going to tell us things that are lies or uh, even offensive? Lies? Can artificial intelligence lie? <laughs> well, okay. that, you're right. I should, and, and I should, non truths. <laughs> and non truths. Yes, lies would imply intent, I suppose, and there's no intent there. What do you think, Sam? I guess. So obviously, you know, if you look at social media, you look at the articles that are coming out of ChatGPT, that obviously there's a lot of evidence and a lot of discussion on how, you know, the issues are perpetuating bias and uh, we'll call it mistruths or misinformation, how it, how, it, how it can perpetuate those as well. And I guess the, the really kind of dark place where it could go is just that the internet just becomes full of just generated text with very little oversight. And not so much truth. Yes, <laughs> just of not truth, <laughs> just if, if random you, maths. That, if you think it's bad now, you just wait to see what it's Yeah, where even, it's going. Even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? <laughs> but that's only twice a day. <laughs> the other, uh, all the other times of the day. So yeah, so that's kind of where it's kind of potentially going. And that's obviously very dangerous. But I guess right now, in today, you know, with today and with our students today and, you know, with its safety in classes, I think it's still being a little over um, overemphasized these points because realistically the internet, which everybody uses for their education and everything else, is gonna be much you know worse in terms of misinformation, hate. And social media, you know, you have algorithms that are actually dictating what you are seeing. Whereas most of the example, not all, but most of the examples that I've seen where, you know, Chat GPT has said something discriminatory people are fishing for it and people are you know actively prompting it knowing that it is trained on an internet which is you know bigoted and racist so it will obviously give those answers because it's just doing what it's trained to do but in most cases you have to kind of be actively seeking these kind of negative consequences right now but as this becomes you know proliferating it could there are change bad, very <laughs> there are bad people out there who are going to be using this as a tool to generate to Swamp okay. social media mm. with untruths and their okay. particular okay. Okay. distorted yes. perspective. Then I, I take that back. I'll roll that back. <laughs> yes. So I guess in the classroom, let me let me paraphrase. In the classroom, so there's a question of is it safe to use Chat ChatGPT? Let's say you're over 18, you're in a university setting, and you're actually using this as a tool in class, which I fully intend to do in two weeks from now, class one in my first year business analytics class. 100%. And what, what are you going to be using it for exactly? Um, I haven't decided, but it's mostly, I mean, maybe just even introduce the topic, you know, uh -huh. why ask me when we have this great tool, but I think it's more just to be like, you know, students, I know you think a lot of your professors live in this academic world under a rock, but we are aware of these things and we are going to meaningfully incorporate these tools into our curriculum to give you the best experience possible. And, you know, if before the journey was climbing Mount Everest, maybe now we're going to the moon. Like, th wow, with these yeah. tools, you know, that's something that potentially one way that we could go with education is just, you know, as you were saying, we can expect more, we can do more things. So, you know, it's one it. solution. But so, certainly I predict the future of how businesses are going to interact with their customers or government is going to interact with their citizens is using these tools. For sure. That, my, you know, as, as soon as I showed this tool to my wife, we wrote a, biz, a complaint letter to Fitbit because a Fitbit had just broken. Sorry, Fitbit, but <laughs> Fitbit did break. Uh, and it was a very good complaint letter, a very nicely written complaint letter. So now Fitbit are going to be receiving so many well-written complaint letters that they're not going to be able to ha afford to employ people to respond to all of them. So they're going to use ChatGPT and tools and its successors to reply. So, I mean, the funny thing there is now we're going to end up with computers writing letters to other computers which are going to be replying. No humans but, involved. But I guess that's already happening. If you think of just job applications and resumes, they're now being screened by AI. And so now you have all these AI tools to kind of beat those screens. Yes. And so we already have, you know, and with pricing on uh, e-commerce websites, it's just another, I guess, 
even larger proliferation of bots playing bots. And if we get to a situation at university where the students are getting an AI bot to write their essay and then the teacher's getting the AI bot to mark the essay. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, we forgot to say in the positive uses of AI, you can, Absolutely. with caution, use them very well to mark essays. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard a, a podcast of a teacher, in a secondary school teacher in the US who was talking about how students can put paragraphs and even whole essays into it and ask it to evaluate the quality of the cohesion. In other words, how well one sentence goes from one to the next. And it can do that in, and this is the other thing we've got to remember, it does it in about 10 seconds. Yes. Right? And the, the point the teacher makes is, I can't do that for my students. I don't want to do that for my students, but there's a tool now that can help them do that. And this is what you're saying, this is the going to the moon piece, so that I can do more meaningful things with my students that only I, as a human teacher, can do. And that's where we're really talking about the way that this is going to liberate human time. It's one of those paradoxes yes. of AI, isn't it? Is the more things that become AI, the more we value the stuff that can only be done by humans. In indeed. Um, as another positive example, students can get the benefit of it being able to mark because sure. they can, before they hand their essay in, they can actually run it through the tool and say, you know, grade this. I, I actually got it to write an essay on the benefits of uh, technology in higher education. And it wrote a, a very competent essay, you say, in 10 seconds. I then got it to mark it and it gave itself a B plus. <laughs> and then I asked it to critique. Confident. <laughs> critique its own essay. Uh, and it wrote, wrote, wrote a very good critique of the essay. It said, well, this, it was quite a balanced uh, essay on the benefits. Um, but the, whilst it said that there were some neg negatives to the use of technology in higher education, it didn't itemize and explain what those negatives were. So then I asked it to write, write what those negatives were and then submitted the new essay for it to mark and now gave itself an A minus. <laughs> I think this is another thing that we're learning about this tool is you actually need to know quite a lot about, this is what I was talking about before, the evaluative judgment skills. You have to have quite a good knowledge of what the difference between not good enough, just good enough and good enough looks like in order to write good prompts to get it to do what you want it to do. There's a lot of talk about it making up references. It'll put references yes. in for you. But if you say to it, don't fabricate the references, it won't. Can I ask, actually, related to that, a question for those who understand a bit more of the back end of this. How well can it evaluate truth? Because you were saying before, uh, right, about, about the problem of untruth. Um, you know, in my playing with it, it sometimes does come up with things that are true and sometimes comes up with things that are either untrue or just poorly argued. If I, you know, the, the argument logic doesn't work. Um, my sense is, therefore, it's my little experiment, that it's not great at necessarily, it might be able to do cohesion and do other kinds mm. of things that we can sort of measure in some sense, but it's not necessarily going to be very good at this is true or this argument is valid or at least not yet, maybe future iterations, I don't know. But am I right in that instinct that it's not yet doing that? No, it's, it's not. It doesn't actually really understand the world uh, reason about the world. It says, as Sam said, it's saying what's sort of probable. So if there's lots of examples of people saying those things, then it will repeat those sorts of things. But it, it, it confident, and this is part of the problem, it confidently makes the stuff up. So I, I asked it about my own biography, <laughs> rather vainly, but I thought, to, something, at least I know the, whether the answer is correct or not. Uh, and it began perfectly correct. It said, it said where I was born. It, um, but then it just started inventing stuff that was close to true, but actually completely false. Um, it, it, it said, you know, I went to different universities to the ones I did, <laughs> nearby to the ones I did go to. Close. Close. It then, it then said I got a PhD in AI, which I did. They got that bit right, but from the wrong university. Oops. And then it decided that I got bored with academia, which I hadn't. <laughs> and I had... What's I had, your alternative career? Well, exactly. This is, this is well, oh, one, of the, one of the things you can use it for. So you can actually ask it to see what your alternative career should have been. <laughs> And it came up with a really good alternative career for me, which I was a, a um, world-class poker player. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd won $7 million in the World Series of Poker, um, which is plausible because you know, people say I'm pretty good at maths. And I, people, people who know me vaguely would have said, oh, yeah, I could imagine Toby after university. Gave up that, those AI dreams and went off and made his fortune playing poker. But I think this is one of the real risks of students using these tools for the wrong reasons. It's so confident when it's wrong. Yes. And a really good example of this, I, sh I have similar questions to you about what it can and can't do, you know, 
Mm. But a really good example was an article on the CNET. Now, I don't know if it was using ChatGPT, so I can't... But CNET did have to retract a lot exactly. of articles that they had secretly written using ChatGPT. Well, I don't know how secret they were, because they did acknowledge that it was using some kind of AI tool eventually. Yes. But yeah, CNET published a whole pile of what we'd call robo-journalism or robo-reporting and put them as, um, I guess, explainers on their website. And it was all edited by a human. So they said, yes, it was generated by an AI tool, but it was edited by a human. But it got compound interest wrong. <laughs> so here's an explainer about how compound interest work. It was edited by a human. Now, that human editor is not used to picking up mistakes like that because human journalists don't tend to get that kind of thing wrong. Human editors are about editing the copy, making sure it's the right word length, getting the right headline for it, getting the right image for it, making sure it's the right tone, but not necessarily checking it for accuracy for things like that. And of course, they had to apologise, they had to retract it and all that kind of stuff. But it's a really important indicator about how human skills are going to have to shift. If you're going to be an editor of robo-reporting and robo-journalism, you're going to have to be looking for different things and correcting different things than if you're editing a human reporter. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think, it's a bit like your, what you were saying before, Sam, we have to stop and re recalibrate, rethink, what are we doing here? What's our value add as teachers? And what do we need to make sure our graduates can do in the world of work? So I'll just jump in there. And I think it's kind of going back to your question. Just my favorite toy example, when I first started playing with ChatGPT Jet, was, I put in, you know, from an academic article that I'd recently written, where I developed, you know, hypothesis, which we test experimentally. So I asked it, you know, develop, you know, how would you argue this hypothesis? And it came pretty close to like what I had done. And then I asked it to argue the opposite. And, you know, huh. and it did a good job and it was confident, but you could clearly see that there was a logical leap that made, that was basically the 180 and it kind of concluded the same way <laughs> the original paragraph concluded. And I'm like, well, you know, that doesn't make sense. They both can't be, they have to be going in opposite ways. But it really got me thinking that, and I guess also with the referencing, you know, if you get it to generate, you know, just paragraphs, it can't reference because it's just guessing at, oh, this person, you know, it's about AI, Toby does AI, and so maybe Probably. he'll write a paper about this, <laughs> and he likes poker, so, you know, so it will just he make stuff now. up. But then it's like, I have used this to write some paragraphs for research. I'll get it to, you know, I'll look at it, I'll use my critical eye, what makes sense, what does not make sense, and then I go to the literature to be like, can I actually back this up? And it makes me start, it's, I guess there's been this debate, at least within my school, about what is the role of research in an undergraduate education? Yeah. Because, you know, are we teaching the bachelors of information systems? Are people go out and, you know, they work as business analysts and, you know, in data engineering and things like that. But research is not a core skill, at least in what these roles traditionally look like. But increasingly, you know, if we're really talking about critical thinking, critical analysis, being able to decipher, you know, truth um, from fake news, research skills are fundamental. And it's making me think that potentially one way some universities might shift is by actually having a much stronger emphasis on research and research skills in our programs, where right now it's very minimal, at least in our degrees. Yeah. So uh, and one of the challenges to, to, to tie that to Lyria's earlier question is that they don't understand causality. So they don't understand, you know, this cause, this cause has this effect, um, and, and so in your example about the hypothesis, it wouldn't understand that actually it had turned the cause, causal arrow on its head um, and said the effect implies the cause. I also think it causes us to stop and pause and think about other things it can't do and doesn't do. You know, the extreme of that is it can't feel. It doesn't have yes. emotion. Um, it's, you know, when you're talking about the infinitely patient tutor. Yes, um, which is an advantage. It's great. Your sat nav <laughs> never gets cross with you if you take a, a wrong turn. And I guess that's... Well, it might be better. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I guess that's the point, is, is valuing the things that are truly human. Um, some other things, so again, back to Nick. But, but, but equally, I mean, so suppose, I mean, there's some, some demonstration using 
AI tools that it's actually a good way to help people who are yeah. otherwise challenged if you're if you're on the spectrum yeah. and you need someone to practice against who's going to be very consistent yeah. and very yeah. patient um, to learn those skills yourself because they don't perhaps come as naturally to you as, as someone and some someone of the else. some of the very early AI tools I believe were actually a kind of counseling context ah. is that right the very first chatbot Eliza was a was a psychotherapist and how did it work? Well, it was written as a cautionary tale. Um, Joseph Eisenbaum in the in the in the 60s when he wrote Eliza, this is the very first chatbot, the the great great granddad granddaddy of ChatGPT, was as a cautionary tale not to remove humans, not to remove human empathy. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, people picked it up and said, "Oh, this is fantastic!" And psychiatrists debated whether this was going to transform the field or not. Um, there are uh, interestingly chat chatbots. Um, like ChatGPT being used, um, for example, to help um, refugees in Germany. They, mm. They've had you know, millions of people arrive in Germany in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. refugees from war zones, refugees who've had traumatic journeys across uh, open oceans in, in small boats, who also, many of whom are suffering post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. And there aren't enough psychiatrists in Germany to, mm -hmm. to individually counsel them, so they're giving them access to these tools. Better than nothing in some sense, but you know, I'd prefer to have more humans, but we can't. We don't have that many uh, human psychotherapists. Now if we come back to our own context again of teaching and learning in a university, another thing I'm thinking about is how might these tools actually pay a part of the broad spectrum of reasonable adjustments that we can make available for students who are living with disabilities, um, particularly you were talking about neurodivergence and other kinds of cognitive disabilities is how might these tools actually be a part of the infrastructure that they use to level the playing field for people who aren't living with those disabilities? Well, I think just in general, it can help level the playing field because I just my personal experience is people that have very, very you know, superior writing skills, mm. it is amazing what good writing can mask. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> if, you know, if let's just say you know business school communication on an essay or report group report usually about 10 percent you know that's probably mm. where it's at but if you take the exact same analysis the exact same content the exact same ideas and one is dressed up with very articulate writing and one has very poor writing it's just human nature that you're going to be so much more critical of the analysis when it's poorly written and you yeah. will find things that you won't find in what's well written. So in a sense, it can help, you know, people who are, let's just say English is not their first language. Yep. You know, it's rather than having to spend so much time crafting a 2,000 word report. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm with you all, all the way, ex except for a couple of things. So I think it comes back to what Kath said before mm. about you know, what kinds of assessments do we want to give our students? And is yeah. it, you know, do we have too many essays, if you like? Yeah. So in in law, it actually being able to articulate an argument well is the skill, right? Yeah. That is actually a really important thing that we want our graduates to have. So the analysis has to be there and the analysis has to be good and the research has to be done. But at the end of the day, if you're going to be arguing a matter in court, actually yeah. the persuasiveness of the way you say it is also a very important professional skill yes right so so in that context we can say actually you, we need to give our students those skills but what we shouldn't be doing I think from from your point is assessing different skills if analysis is actually what we really want to be assessing then saying write an essay might not be the best way to check that the students have the analytical skills because we can if you like you know it, it sort of biases the 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 the, um, the marking, if you like, against what you're actually trying to teach. Exactly. Yes. From a pedagogical point of view, we'd call this validity. It's are we validly measuring the learning that we're needing to see here? And the problem I think you're referring to here is what Chloe Walker refers to as the problem of the passable essay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the problem that we've got, where a marker might look at a piece of work and say. The ideas aren't there and the content's not really what we're focusing on in this course, but, but it's really well written, yeah. so I have to pass it. And I think the point that I really want to sort of um, echo the, from what you're saying is that we need to be more prepared to say no, just because it's beautifully written, just because the sentences are grammatically perfect, just because the possessive apostrophes are in exactly the right place. <laughs> 
if the actual learning we're seeking there and we need to have demonstrated isn't there, we need to be prepared to say, no, not yet good enough. But I guess, so it kind of gives us two different paths and you know, probably the ultimate solution will be a blend of this, but you kind of on one stream, when we're looking at assessments um, and just you know, how do we kind of judge learning, you could really either you know go back to ask for the moon nail because you have these tools. You can get this huge head start mm -hmm. and then really refine and be persuasive and make good arguments, etc. Or you could kind of be like, we don't care about the end result. You know, all we care about is your process mm -hmm. and articulating your process or your reflections and what you end up creating, whatever that you know, whether it's a report or some type of artifact, that that doesn't really matter. Uh, and how are we going to grade the process? So to understand. Yeah. So, I I mean I think this whole th I don't mean I'm not well informed on the debate of you know whether things should just be pass fail or whether we should have you know a grading spectrum. But I guess from COVID that debate definitely reemerged, and I think that you know for some universities this might be the answer. Maybe it is better to just kind of have some sort of pass fail systems, and you're not caught up in you know, the, the, the nuances and the, the, the challenges with then really grading what people have learned at such a fine scale when you don't know yourself, what is them, what is AI, was it just AI with proper prompts? I mean, what, one suggestion, and I, I know the problem with it, you're going to tell me the problem with it, I'm sure, which is uh, oral examinations. I mean, you can, if you sit down with someone, you what, have a conversation, okay. you can really probe their understanding yes. where they're at. Um, and that's actually quite an old-fashioned way of examining. So two issues with that, but I'm curious as to what you think the, my response will be. I, I thought you were going to say it doesn't scale. Yes, it's, that's it, number one. It's, 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 it's a perfect examination, oh. but um, with the, especially with the large class sizes, unfortunately, we struggle with these days. We, yeah, 600 we, people in my class, people. two weeks. <laughs> if you gave each of them an hour's oral examination, that's, that's half but a year. I would, you don't yeah. need an hour. You can have a 15 minute conversation with somebody and get a really strong sense of what they've been able to learn. Even so, that's Still, three or four weeks. Yeah, so I've done the math. It doesn't it. work. It takes me longer than that to mark a 2,500 word Not essay. Not with ChatGPT, you were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got me there. But I think the other issue, and some people have also brought this up, is, you know, as everybody is so different, and the way we talked about some people yes. aren't great writers, some people just, you know, would totally buckle under the pressure of an oral ex exam and you know maybe that's just life and that's something we value or you know maybe there's a spectrum of skills that people can be good at and to put so much emphasis on something that could be you know and it's not I guess even with written exams where you have the pressure you're usually one student in like an arena full of thousands of other students not just one-on-one -on -one yes. with someone yeah. I'd still rather we thought of it not as what's higher pressure, lower pressure, who's good at this skill versus that skill, and more when do they need to be able to do yes, that um, as a sort of graduate attribute. So again, coming back to law, oral advocacy <laughs> and oral explanations to clients is really important. If you're not good at that, then, you know, th th this might not be the best pathway, or at least in certain kinds of, 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 of subject matters. Absolutely, and I think what I'm loving about this conversation and what I think we should celebrate is that ChatGPT, like it or loathe it, has prompted really rich conversations amongst educators everywhere around the world. I mean, if we go back to the point you were making about grading and ungrading, what we're seeing in an increasing number of accrediting bodies is they come to us as an institution who we co-accredit their graduates with, and they say, we don't really care that much about the high distinction or the A plus students, they're gonna be fine, but we really need to be sure that we're confident where the pass-fail mark is. And a lot of the accrediting bodies are coming to us and saying, show us what just good enough looks like. Show us what a bare pass looks like and how it's different from a fail. And I think that we have got a bit caught up with worrying about the fine grain. Is that an 82? Oh, no, 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 I think <laughs> it's an 81. And it's what Martin Bean refers to as the difference between classifying and qualifying. You know. Qualifying is, are we graduating lawyers who are safe, competent practitioners? Are we graduating engineers, doctors, dentists, candlestick makers, <laughs> yeah, who are safe, competent practitioners? That's where the pass-fail grade should be. Once they've shown us they can safely get over that, 
that's when we start saying, okay, well, are you a pass or a credit or a distinction or a high distinction? And I think I'm, you know, I'm agreeing with you here that sometimes then we don't need that fine grained detail every single time, but we do need to be competent or confident that we're getting competent outcomes from our learning. Isn't it, isn't it also reflecting how university isn't the end point of education Absolutely. anymore? Absolutely. I mean, it, at some, some point it might have been considered that you learnt what you needed to know and then you could go out and work. Fully cooked, world. yep. And <laughs> now we're realising actually, no, education is a con con continual thing. It's Absolutely. going to, you know, uh, university is going to teach you how to learn, give you the critical skills Absolutely. to then learn what you might need on the job. I mean, there's so, lots, of, yep. lots of practical stuff that we don't teach students. And I guess what's kind of interesting about you know, all this chat about education, you know, we start thinking about, are we preparing now our students for this new world? But, I mean, my guess is the people who are most impacted by this are going to be people in jobs right now and yeah. have been in jobs for the last yeah. 15 years where, you know, lifelong education and these types of learning skills were not really a focus or even in discussions at universities. And so, Whatever happens with, you know, whatever the world looks like in four years for our incoming graduates, you know, given that we are preparing them for lifelong learning, largely they'll be fine. They will figure it out. They'll, you know, develop skills that will help them navigate this new world. But for all the people that are kind of in these jobs, copyright jobs and things that are, you know, fairly replaceable by AI, it's much harder to become dynamic once you've been kind of entrenched in a role for so long. I think that's a great point. You know, it's reminding us of our important function in the university as continuous professional development providers. And I think about your field, the war, you know, the law field, I don't know much about it, but I know lots of lawyers are actually starting to use AI tools to find case law and the Well, they've been using, you know, the, the sort of um, the way people find cases relevant to a point has relied on various kinds of AI, if you like, for a very long time. Exactly. I mean, even just the sort of search algorithms, you know, we've gone beyond the, you know, sort of word search, phrase search kind of things into, you know, being able to, you know, ask questions in much more natural language and get responses on, you know, percentage likelihood of relevance rather than just yes or no. So, yes. Um, and those sort of things, I mean, in a lot of professions, there is actually lifelong learning anyway. So, so in law, we have continuous legal education that's mandatory as part of your license. So, so I, I, I think that, you know, it's not such a disjuncture to say we didn't have and now we have. I actually think, though, what we, need, what we also need to do is make sure that everyone is not just up with using the tool. But mm. I want to actually at some point in the conversation mm. go back to... Kath, what you were saying before about ethically, legally, yes. appropriately, what yep. other, other sets of words we want to use because my... Responsibly. Responsibly. <laughs> but there will be a sense in which anyone can go and look at chat GPT and see what it can do. Mm. But the harder thing to learn if you're already working in a job is, is this okay? Mm. So if you're a journalist, for example, mm. can you get the, the bot to write your story for you and just submit it to your editor? Now... My sense of that is a, is a very strong no. Well, um, <laughs> well, I think there are certainly some instances where robo-reporting and robo-journalism, we'd all have to agree, is a great thing. You know, sports for us. Sports I'm not sure all, all journalists think the decreasing number of jobs in journalism is well, a great thing. But this sports reporting, election reporting and stock market reporting are the three examples that I've been given. They're pretty formulaic. There's a lot of sort of stable... Well, not stable in the stock market, but, but you know, standardised kind of data coming in. And it's pretty boring. You know, that's the sort of quite tedious reporting that a lot of people find boring. Now, a really good example I heard of is that there's a robo-reporter watching the seismic activity around the world. Yes, the first, the first tweet you'll get about seismic activity is from the computer. Always. Exactly. And now there's an... So, and it, it is now... And, and, and Print journalists and TV journalists know to follow that. Stream. Exactly. But I think it's now also writing a story yes, that can yes. now, and you know, no human reporter is going to want to do that job. So there are or definite, can do it as quickly. Yeah, exactly. So there are certain things we've got to accept. That this is actually replacing some jobs that are pretty boring. Oh, and, and, and the, the other positive example is that they get robo reporters to write on fantasy leagues. So ah, if, you, if you start up a fantasy football league, People get robo reporters to talk about the results and okay. 
the world wouldn't have enough patience to have reporters doing that. But there are qualifiers to that, right? Exactly. And, and, and a lot of the qualifiers are around honesty. Exactly. Um, and the other qualifiers are around things like copyright and and, and where these, where, what the, which is twofold. So I'll come, I'll, I'll do yes. the honesty first, right? So Good. if you submitted work to somebody and as part of your job, you're actually paid to be a human journalist, not a robo journalist, right? Um, and you have a contract of employment and so forth and you... I mean, in the same ways, if you plagiarised your submissions, if you simply use these kinds of tools without disclosure to your employer, without this actually being part of your job description, then you could fall foul of your employment contract. You could um, fall foul of ethic, you know, it's ethics unethical, of professional it? journalism. Yeah. Um, you could even be said to be getting a financial benefit through deception if you're being paid to do something that on the basis of a sort of misrepresentation of, of what you're doing. So there's all sorts of problems you can run into if, you, if you're not careful, right? For sure. Um, similarly, going, um, you know, looking at it from a student perspective, I think we've been very positive and everyone should use it and so forth. But we also have to be careful of staying within the, the code of student conduct, right? Absolutely. So, so if, again, you, you copy um, text without you know, putting it in quotes and citing the source. If, if that text is the output of chat GPT, it's the, as I read the policies, it's the same rule, right? If you copy that text into your essay, it's not in quotes citing this was the output of chat GPT. Well, that's what the um, all of the South Australian universities have said. You can use it, but you must cite it. You must acknowledge it. You must acknowledge it, right? So, so now if you handed in work again, where that's not the instructions, depends on what you're asked to do, where... The, the, the submitted assignment was a full page, all in quotes, with a footnote saying this was produced by Chad GPT. It's um, probably not going to get you a very high mark, um, again, unless that's part of what you were sure. asked to do. So, um, again, I think there's sort of, you know, student consequences of, you know, falling foul of the student code of conduct, potentially leading to academic misconduct, potentially leading to in areas like law, you can't get admitted because you're not a fit and proper person. So there are there are consequences for a student okay. doing it. Um, there are consequences but doing it in your job. In, I just, to play devil's advocate, I mean, when we went online with our exams and, you know, we make them obviously sign a page that says, you know, this 24 hour take home exam, they will under no circumstances talk to any other students <laughs> and, you know, share ideas or information that they have to do this. They all sign it, but I have no way of knowing how many would actually break that code of conduct. So, well, is there's it not two answers to that, right? right? Yeah. One is, you know, there are ways and you might Absolutely. get caught, um, and it depends on how good the, per the observer is. Um, how, how stupid the person cheating is. Well, yeah. yes. <laughs> that, that, and, but how also, could they you know, are covering their tracks? Yes. So, you know, and there are tools that can sort of sure. give probabilities of was it written by an AI as well as other sorts of things. So one can go down that path. Um, or there's the simple answer of, you know, um, you know, sort of engaging with the student's own code of integrity. You know, what are you here to do the degree for? And giving them a sense of ownership of their own education that means that they are wanting to learn and so now is it perfect neither of those two things are perfect um, and you will inevitably in, with 600 students i think it's probably fair to say that some of them are signing that document and no one will ever know that they're lying about what they're what they're signing um but you know, we have that problem now anyway. I mean, exactly. You know, and it's, the, not, it's not limited to this new context. We have to remember when we're in both a cooperative and an adversarial relationship with the people enrolled in our programs. And so we need both an academic integrity discourse or approach as well as an assessment security approach. Hopefully more cooperative than adversarial. Well, yeah, <laughs> presumably. But it also, yeah. I think it comes back then to just really to the very beginning on, you know, what is the purpose of exactly. the university? Because with your, your last point, for most people, their incentive to be here is just societal expectations to get good grades. And it very often has little to do with learning or just, I want this career, so I want, I'll do this degree. I think a lot of people aren't necessarily here to just, and maybe this is my own cynical view, but <laughs> I don't think a lot of people are here with the primary objective is to learn. And the way we conduct university, just because you know we do it at such a scale, is much more focused on assessment and on grades and on marks than really on learning. As much as we are trying to shift in that direction, 
I think this is, again, just the, the straw that's breaking the camel's back on really being like, what is education and university for? Lyria, let's make it much more personal. What was your response when um, a startup in the United States announced that they were going to defend a court case by using ChatGPT in the ear of the barrister? What was my reaction to that? Um, first That's of all, presumably, uh, yeah, first think of all, I think clearly a gimmick. I mean, that was clearly yes. a, um, you know, a sort of a, a bit of a, um, you know, I, I actually think the problem there to me is less the idea that you might use ChatGPT in formulating a submission to a court and more in the idea that you'd then bother with a human intermediary. I mean, you know, <laughs> in other words, it's the misrepresentation of what you're doing, I think, yeah. that becomes the problem. I mean, but, but you're happy with lawyers being replaced by ChatGPT? Well, if that's if it's sufficiently on. good defence so, so, compared to some of the poor defence that they might otherwise so, have. So I'm, I'm happy with, I mean, I think this comes down to the, some of the quality arguments, right? So we can, and we can, you know, go back there. But, you know, is it, if there are, and there are certainly things that, um, you know, and whether one uses the sometimes it's not even AI, sometimes it's very simple tools, can do really well and, in fact, just as well as a human. And it's almost like the, the calculator example. So, for, for you know, for instance, um, you know, you could, you, someone could come to me and say, you know, what am I entitled to in terms of social welfare benefits um, under, you know, under the various pieces of legislation? And I could research it and read them all and work it out and give them advice. Or I could use one of the many very helpful, accurate calculators that exist that for most people and most circumstances will come up with an accurate number. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's going to be more efficient to do it that way in terms of having to pay a lawyer for that person and so forth. Now, if you're talking about, you know, representations in court, um, often you're talking about far more complex matters um, where I believe in a lot of the times you're talking about matters that are sufficiently contentious to end up in court in the first place, that the lack of accuracy filter, if I can call it that, is going to fundamentally um, be part of your downfall, as is the lack of a certain kind of creativity. So, for example, and this is partly because it's based on a historical data set, um, no AI would ever have written the decision in Marbo, mm. right? Because, it, you know, if it looked at all the actual cases that had been decided and reformulated how the previous courts had said no, they, absolutely not. they would still say no. <laughs> Um, it took a sort of act of, of um, you know, a different kind of creativity than the kind of creativity that these tools have to say, no, actually, given, you know, all of the things and all of the way the history really played out, we need to re fundamentally rethink this mm -hmm. and here's the new way these cases are going to work. Similarly, for, for, for you know, m more of this than, I mean, I use Marbo as a, as a sort of really clear example, but most of the time when a matter is going to court, there is at least an element, and it might not be quite the burning fire of Marble, it might be a much smaller spark, but there is an element of having to go beyond what has come previously. Because if you could do it just with that, hopefully your lawyers have already advised you don't go to court. <laughs> so in that sense, I don't think it would do it well. Um, but having said that, if in certain kinds of cases, um, you know, relatively simple matters, small claims, whatever you want to think of it as, where the, there's, there's millions of the same sort of thing, this person owes me money under the contract and they haven't paid, you know, the sort of cases that come up repeatedly and have very similar answers every time based on sort of a handful of variables. Um, could you potentially do that? Yes. Do I think we should have a fake human with an earpiece <laughs> if we think that is the right way to do it? No, I think you can actually devise mm. tools that will help litigants in person write their own written submissions, um, you know, based on on all of that and, and even potentially do a first draft, you know, for the for the magistrate or judge. Um, you know, I think we can talk about that. We have to think through all the legal issues, which we haven't really done yet, but the ones I've, I've mentioned, um, which are mostly about fraud, but copyright is obviously another big one in that kind of context. Um, not only whatever the rules are for chat GPT and any copyright claim by the, the software provider, but also because it is re-crunching things that have previously existed. Mm. There's the possibility of, of copyright being owned by someone in the underlying works that have been re-coagulated for you. So, so there's many issues to be solved in something like that, and um, you know, lots of questions. But I think whatever the answer is, if you're going to be doing it legally, ethically, appropriately, responsibly, um, it will involve, you know, not the fake human in between, but very much an honest process where this is the most efficient way to handle this kind of, kind of transparency. Mm. Great. Oh, well, I think we could carry on talking for another hour, but 
um, our time is up. So thank you very much and thank you for joining us.